Uh, I thought it was going to be a simultaneous translation, so I, I did it in Portuguese. So the Brazilians would be happy, and I also have good news because uh, for the Brazilians, because I would present to a certain extent the Brazilian case on food security, how Brazil has managed to, I wouldn't say eradicate hunger, but at least to uh, what we say uh, move out of the map of hunger, because now it's less than 5%, and from FAO standards to be below uh, 5%, it means that um, it's no longer a structural problem, you know. Sorry, my mobile phone is ringing, so I would have to. Always, huh? <laughs> okay. So, um, let's move to the second. What I would present here is, first of all, I give uh, an overall view of, um, particularly every year around September, FAO publishes a report which shows the situation of uh, undernutrition, uh, which in fact is mainly about calories. We, n we don't talk about micronutrients, as uh, our former colleague did. Uh, so I would present the summary of the global situation. Then I would talk about Latin America, how also Latin America has evolved in the last 10 years. And of course, I would concentrate then on uh, the, the, the case of Brazil, how, how Brazil has emerged out of, of the map of hunger. And also, I would, uh, considering that this is the year of family farming, I would also give a perspective on family farming and the issues that needs to be addressed related to, to food security, of course. And of course, the, the final conclusions there. Um, Yes, very, very important to mention that uh, what we do in FAO is within the overall, uh, the overarching uh, agenda. First, the agenda uh, that was uh, the Millennium Goals agenda that was that were set for uh, year 2015, but they were set on the year 2000. And of course, that meant uh, that under objective one, that we should have at least a proportion of people in the world uh, living with hunger. And that has been achieved by many countries, several countries have done it, but still many other countries have not. Uh, middle income countries particularly have achieved that. And it's very important to mention that there were two set of goals. One is the Millennium Development Agenda, and the other is the agenda of the World Food Summit, which was uh, a few years earlier than that, 1996. And they were tougher goals, the ones that were set by the uh, uh, World uh, Food Summit, because we're not talking of uh, proportion, we're, uh, we're talking of absolute numbers, so it's, it's certainly a tougher. And Brazil has achieved both the uh, Millennium Development uh, Agenda and the uh, uh, World Food Summit agenda. So now we have new goals. Uh, recently in, in September, the um, uh, UN Assembly defined new goals, which are, to my understanding, a bit more complex than the former 10. And they also have many more also uh, uh, goals there. But anyhow, we, we, uh, under there, the first one deals with eradicating uh, poverty everywhere and in each place of the world. So it's a very ambitious new goal of the new development agenda. Uh, and of course, we're not just talking of uh, development objectives. We're talking of sustainable development objective, which really matches very much with the purpose of this event. So SDO means uh, sustainable development objective. And the second one is uh, to eradicate hunger, uh, to achieve food security, and to improve nutrition, and to promote sustainable agriculture. So that, that's very clear. So within this new agenda that is being set for year 2030, the first two ones have very much to do with what we're doing here these days. Uh, well, for FAO, that has two implications. First, that we should 
concentrate on eradicating hunger by year 2030. Every, we still, as we, I will show in the next uh, uh, slide, we have 805 million people undernourished. And also, uh, we have to deal how we do this in the future. We will have a growing population. Again, I will show you the figures there. But we will have at least uh, a couple of billion people more than what we have today by year 2050. And that means also that those newcomers won't be starving, won't, won't be hungry. So this is our, uh, perfect, okay. This is uh, what we produce every year. It is the uh, state of food insecurity in the world. This is the summary of the table. And you can see that by year uh, 1990, we had more than a billion hungry people, you know. And the good news is that we have uh, gone down to 805, which means uh, about 200 million less. But still, the bad news is that's still a large number. But we have a trend of decreasing. Uh, and the good news are for uh, Latin America. We had in the year 1990 about 68 million. It's gone down to almost half of that. Now we have 37 million. So it's a country where, I mean, it's a region in the world, it's a hemisphere that has done more progress overall. And of course, Asia also, from uh, 742 million has gone down to 525. Again, almost uh, 200 million people less than what we had 20 years ago. Uh, but the bad news is Africa. From 882, we went up to 226. So Africa is still a continent where we have an increasing trend in terms of uh, hungry people. Uh, so to summarize that table, we can say that still we have 100, 805 million people that are hungry, which means that are eating less calories than are needed to have a healthy life. Calories, I, I, I insist in that I'm speaking of, of calories. Uh, which means one in every nine people, which means one in every four for Africa, and in some countries even more, uh, and which is a sort of a chronic hunger. Uh, this is what uh, we have for the future. This is the, the you know, probably all of you are familiarized with this table. Uh, we had uh, less than a billion people in the world by year 1750, and we expect to have more than a, a nine billion people by year 2050. And most of that population will be in the developing world, so we'll have like more, uh, an extra two billion people, which need to be fed. And we're very optimistic that that can be done. I mean, we, we certainly believe, but that's not an easy task. It's not an easy job. And, and we need a lot of science for that. So means uh, that uh, figure particularly means that we will have 34% more people than what we have now. And most of it would be urban and most of it would have a, a larger income than what we have today. So demand on food would be certainly higher because we're also changing patterns of consumption. We're eating more meat, we're eating more vegetables, more fruits, and that's an increasing trend for, for those uh, things which in many cases have, of course, environmental implications. Uh, so we need to increase, to feed this amount of people, we need to increase food in about 70% more of what we have now. Uh, and of course, improve distribution, which is certainly the, the, the issue. Uh, and we need at least to produce 2.5 billion tons of basic grains, uh, maize, uh, rice, wheat, and about 200 million tons of meat. So meat is also a big, big issue in terms of future demand, particularly fish meat. 
Um, and of course, we have to think very carefully on how we do this in terms of the environment. Uh, because currently, according to the International pa uh, Panel on Climate Change, agriculture and related activities means about 20% of all anthropogenic uh, greenhouse uh, emissions. So, uh, and the idea is how can we lower that uh, contribution of agriculture in terms of, of the emission, particularly carbon emissions. So the great challenge is how do we have an agriculture that would be uh, carbon, uh, with less carbon, and of course uh, with less impact on soils, water, and other natural resources. For Latin America, we have also good news, as I was saying. This was the situation in 1990. Uh, we had lots of countries with more than 20% of the population in a situation of um, being undernourished. You see all these countries were, uh, and even some countries above uh, 35%. Uh, Brazil had like 10, 12% uh, those days. And this has changed to this. This is a situation nowadays. Really good news, only Haiti, Haiti is right here, is the only country that is uh, really, and Bolivia which is around 19%, but most of them have come really down at very significant levels. Uh, you can see Brazil now is under 5%, here is Brazil, uh, and you have all the eight countries in Latin America with less than 5%. So it's really a continent that has done a lot of progress in terms of reducing hunger. And how has this come? What is, what's, what's the explanation? How come Latin American countries? The first of all is that it's been a very strong political commitment. Most governments have put food security as on the top of their agendas and have put money into that. Budgets have increased budgets for issues related to eradicating hunger. Uh, and, and of course, uh, most actors have also been involved. It's not just government, but also civil society has been very active in, in Latin America in terms of agenda. Parliaments have been very active. Most of the parliaments do have commissions uh, on food security, and they have a network, uh, Latin American network, on, on food security, where they exchange experiences, where they exchange uh, knowledge, uh, private sector has been very active, so the involvement of different uh, and key actors have been part of the explanation for the success. And of course, uh, the economic situation, Latin America in the last 10 years have done quite well in terms of economic growth, and also in terms of social policies, a lot of social policies focusing on the, on the poorest, and uh, social protection measures, and now, speaking of Brazil, you know, as I was showing, Brazil had uh, about 14% of the population like 15 years ago. Now it's less than 5%, and, and it's around 3%, in fact. Um, so it's really done really well. And uh, the Brazilian uh, food security system they have a set of indicators, and I have used the Brazilian system. It's not the FAO system, but it's a Brazilian system for monitoring uh, food security. And that uh, system has six uh, uh, indicators, one related to the production of food, agricultural production. Uh, this is availability of food, income, and spending on food. Uh, access to adequate food, which means food of good quality, not, not just, uh, let's say, junk food. Uh, health uh, indicators, access to health uh, services, and, of course, uh, uh, education. So for each one of those issues, we have used indicators to, to, to see how it has evolved, and always trying to explain why. Why has happened? How come Brazil has, uh, in each one of the different dimensions of food security, has, gone, has done well? But not in all, as I will show you later. 
Uh, this is just an evolution, a table that shows the evolution of the Brazilian uh, governance on, on food security. It's not uh, a new, the commitment on, on, with food security is not really new. It comes from even uh, Josué de Castro, which was uh, also a, a president of FAO in, in the 50s. But he was very much committed to put uh, very high on the agenda food security issues in, in Brazil in the 50s, even 60s. He wrote a lot about the uh, geopolitics of hunger in, in Brazil, uh, and also Betinho is also a, a remarkable person in that regard. And then Brazil has been, uh, it's been being built uh, an institutional framework to deal with that. One of them is the CONSEIA, which is the National Council on Food Security, which is an interesting council. It's represented by a representative of each one of the Brazilian states, the 26 plus the federal district. Uh, it's mainly handled by civil society, but is very close to the uh, executive power. The offices are within the, 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 the presidential palace in, in Brazilia. And they are also well-funded. Uh, it, it's, it's an organization. They mainly do advise. It's, it's, it's an organization, but also it's very interesting because they bring all the issues uh, of, of the um, food security agenda in Brazil to the very top because ministers do participate of that. Um, the different uh, uh, actors, um, NGOs participate. So it's, it's a very interesting scheme the Conseya scheme. Uh, in the, uh, around 200, 2002, the Brazilian launched an initiative, which is the Zero Hunger Initiative, which is mainly to eradicate hunger in Brazil. It's been a successful strategy. Uh, nowadays, it involves more than 19 ministries committed to that. There is a, an organic law on food uh, security, you have the national system, there is a national policy that was launched in 2010. Uh, the budgets have increased tremendously for each one of the different items, as I will show in the next slide. And there is a national plan, and there is a um, program which is called Bolsa Familia, which is a way by, of subsidizing the poorest families in Brazil to have access to food. So they, they, they have an income that really most of it is, uh, uh, is invested in, in buying food. So in terms of the dimension of food production, Brazil has done remarkable because they have increased the production uh, uh, in about 60% in only 10 years, which is really a lot. A lot of it is soybeans, you may say, a lot of it is maize, but anyhow, uh, it's also meat, it's also other products. So the, the, the overall production of Brazil has increased tremendously in the last uh, uh, 10 years. And not just uh, what we call the agribusiness uh, type of agriculture, but it's also family farming agriculture that has increased uh, uh, to a very good extent. The other dimension of food security which has to do with access to food uh, means that Brazil has done quite well in terms of reducing inequality. Uh, around 2000 it was uh, 0 0.6 of the Gini coefficient, the, uh, the index, has gone down to less than 0 0.5, so it has improved uh, this indicator. It's still quite high. I mean, 0 0.5 is still high, but it's, it's going down. It's a very good trend of reducing inequality in the country, which also means improving access to food. Uh, this is also the prevalence of stunting. Uh, and it's very nice to note that it's gone down uh, from 9.2 to 3.7, which uh, uh, this is about uh, the, the, the weight. Uh, expected weight for, for uh, small children, less than five years. And um, the overall behavior of Brazil is also uh, really good in terms of, 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 uh, of that indicator. Uh, access to health also has um, done well. You can see the, the indicators here. Uh, 
particularly infant mortality has gone down from 26 to 15, from 1,000 uh, born between those, uh, that period. Uh, but on the other hand, and this is the, the bad news, is that um, overweight has increased tremendously in the country in, in the same period. So overweight is becoming one of the key issues to be to address by the Brazilian society. And, and of course, there are many explanations for that. And of course, that also has implications for the health service, particularly, sorry, particularly in terms of uh, accidents of uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, which has also been increasing rather than decreasing. Uh, so the social policies are part of the explanation of the Brazilian success. I'm not talking of overweight, I'm talking of the other part of uh, food security. But um, you can see that uh, minimum uh, wage has been key to that because has gone about 70% in, in more or less the same period has increased the amount of public spending on, on food-related issues, uh, social policies. This is the, the Bolsa Familia that I mentioned, uh, which is really has uh, it's gone down three, threefold in, in, in that period, the, the amount of money invested in, in, in such a large program, which is a program that reaches at least uh, 30, uh, 13 million uh, people in Brazil. Uh, uh, food uh, um, uh, nutrition at schools is also a program that reaches about 43 million kids in, 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 in the different states of Brazil. The uh, family farming sort of uh, uh, support uh, different programs. Uh, there are some of the programs that have have uh, been developed, and the National uh, Development Rural, uh, Rural Development Plan, which is also one of the key uh, issues of Brazilian agricultural policy. Um, again, just to, to summarize the, the case of Brazil, first of all to say that uh, this has been possible because there was a political commitment, a strong political commitment, the government system, participation of, of the different actors, uh, the perspective of uh, uh, to take food security as a right for the citizens, which is in the constitution, in the different laws, by laws, is very much incorporated in the philosophy of um, how the, the state operates. I mean, this uh, right to food is, is been really key and it's something that Brazil is exporting to other countries in terms of legislation, in terms of bylaws, in terms of uh, how the states uh, should commit budgets to food is also part of, of, of the explanation. The participatory approach that I already mentioned, uh, articulated policies, very important. The health policy, the food policy, the agricultural policy, even the infrastructure policies are very much articulated when it comes to food. You know? So it's, it's also an interesting approach how Brazil has managed to articulate different policies. Monitoring of, of food security, the different dimensions. And also, Brazil has been very active in the different fora uh, where food issues um, are being discussed. Say it uh, at the regional level, say it at the global level. Brazil is, is a key actor that is uh, uh, promoting, is, I would say it's not a casualty that the general director of FAO is a Brazilian, you know, because they're really very active in, in, in these forums. Uh, I would briefly mention uh, something on um, the, the, the International Year of Family Farming, because it was a good uh, opportunity, given that the United Nations declared 2000 and 14 as a year of family farming is a good opportunity to enlarge the visibility of this sector, how it contributes to food security, and how it uh, is it gets visible by the urban consumers that many times do not 
think where food comes from, uh, and particularly when, when it comes to uh, family farming. So um, just to say that there are more than 500 million uh, family farming units in the world, about 17 million of them are in Latin America and about 5 million in Brazil. Uh, about 98% of all un agricultural units in the world are being handled by family farming producers. And at least uh, around 50% of total food production in the world comes from family farming. So it's really a key actor in terms of, 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 of food uh, supply. Uh, for Latin America, as I mentioned, 17 million units, about 60 million people involved in that production, 80% uh, of all uh, uh, units. And uh, of course, uh, uh, in many products like maize, cassava, rice, they represent more than 70% of all production of, of such uh, commodities or such uh, staple uh, uh, crops. However, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, there is a yield gap. This is a world map that shows the, uh, the darker regions where the productivity is higher. You see the north of India, China, Europe, the corn belt in the United States. But in other regions like Africa, the yields are very low, and some areas also of Latin America where yields are, are, are quite low, and that's one of the biggest challenge. How can we improve productivity to produce food by family farming in the future without compromising environmental matters? So we need an agriculture that can adapt to the new uh, technological challenges. We need to aggregate more value to family farming uh, products. Uh, we need to deal with this issue of an increasing urbanization because a lot of people are leaving family farming to go to the cities and in many cases these are being like in the south of Brazil uh, most of the uh, producers are over 60 70 years old the young people don't want to stay in the in the, in the farms anymore and, and, and it's certainly a key issue to to be addressed uh, the changes in the consumption patterns for the future will certainly have a different diet than what we have now in 20 years' time. And family farming also needs to adapt to these new consumption patterns and new products that are being developed. So we need to have a more adaptive uh, uh, sort of production coming from family farming. Uh, so we need innovation for that. Uh, for a larger productivity. We need uh, more sustainable practices. Uh, family farming does not imply that everyone is ecological of those producers. A lot of chemicals are being used in, in, in the production of, of uh, a lot of the products that, that are being produced by, by family farms. Um, and of course, still, there is a large uh, set of emissions that are being done with family farming, so it's also an issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Uh, the big uh, uh, issue of uh, bioenergies, you know, the need to introduce uh, um, less uh, technologies that use less carbon emissions, um, the water use also, biodiversity, and in, to summarize, we need to produce much more in family farming with less inputs. You know, we, we need to decarbonize the, 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 the overall production of family farming. Big challenge for the world, not just for Brazil, but overall challenge. These are also some of the issues that need to be addressed. One of the, probably uh, I would mention here, the um, uh, purchases from family farming, which is very successful in Brazil, but it has a scheme by which at least 30% of what is being uh, bought to supply schools, to supply 
public uh, organizations, uh, public services, should come from family farming. Uh, and, uh, and, and most of the states are, are really accomplishing that because it generates a stable market, it generates a stable prices for, for family products, uh, family farming products, and um, it creates good synergies within the communities. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting scheme that now it's also been enlarged to other countries in, in Latin America, and it's also strengthening family farming overall because now they have really a stable income to rely upon and also uh, it helps uh, the marketing, they are less dependent on, on intermediaries and so on. Microfinance schemes, uh, uh, access to land, which could be an issue that we can speak the whole morning, but it's not the case. Intensification of production, uh, and also how to make more efficient the food chains, the value chains uh, with services for family farming. So to conclude, uh, we believe that in FAO that the world can achieve those uh, big challenges of feeding the world for the future, eradicating hunger, but of course we need to do a lot the challenge is really huge, it's daunting uh, challenge because as we need to have a more environmental uh, uh, friendly production, we need to improve the mechanism of distribution, lots of more social policies, that's implications for fiscal policies, how can, where are we going to get the money to invest more in, in family farming or other types of how can we improve the access to food, which is really the central matter, you know, so that everybody could have the, the money to purchase the food that they need. So uh, the, 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 the challenge is really very high. We need a lot of science for that. We need a lot of technology. We need to, to think how, how we're gonna do, and that has to do with social, sciences that has to do with agricultural sciences, with economic science. So in general, the, the, the challenge is that we need a lot of political mobilization, political commitment, political will to build institutions that are necessary to make this happen. Uh, 80% of the production for the future should come from increased productivity, not just increased area. There's very little area left in the world to be added to current production, so productivity is, is a key issue. Uh, increasing yields, and of course, consumption patterns was very, also very well exemplified by our colleague from, from China that, that really stressed that issue. Uh, and we need more investments in agriculture overall. I think that was it. Very quick, huh? Quick, okay, thank you very much.